All right, this is a re-recording of a presentation from the Science Party January meeting, so I'm able to uh, include some more updated information that I didn't have at the time of that meeting. So now this is an electron microscope image of the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19 and which has changed our world so dramatically in the last year. Vaccination is already a reality in some countries and it's on the horizon here in Australia. However, some countries are looking at a three-year wait for the vaccine, uh, demonstrating that the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. Now, firstly, as a disclaimer, I work in the COVID-19 response branch at New South Wales Health. I'm in a small team that liaises with labs to get test results for people in hotel quarantine or for people of particular interest during an outbreak investigation. The close contact tracing team is another part of the response branch and they are amazing as other people who collect and test in the lab tens of thousands of swabs every day. Testing and tracing is how we stop an outbreak and wearing masks and other hygiene measures are things that we all need to do to reduce our risk of spreading a virus whenever it is in the community. This slide here shows the Swiss cheese model which, um, as it applies to a respiratory virus. Every action here that we take to stop the spread is not going to be perfect. It's going to have holes in it when we put it into action. And um, if we apply lots of layers at once, lots of actions at once, the holes are less likely to line up and we're less likely to transmit the virus. Uh, a possible hole that's appeared in one or more of these slices of cheese is the new strains of the virus that we're hearing about. These are the variants of concern, as they're sometimes referred to, um, as though the original strain of the virus that has brought the world to a standstill is not of concern. Uh, these strains are kind of sometimes named after the parts of the world where they were first described, but the public health sector is trying to avoid this kind of nomenclature. Um, but uh, it has to be said that the scientific names like strain B.1.1.7 don't exactly roll off the tongue. Um, these strains are somewhat more infectious than the original, which is why they've become more prevalent. They tend to outcompete the existing uh, or original strains but uh, the strains don't seem to cause more severe disease. Um, however, if we have more infected people due to the more contagious strain, we will get more severely ill people just due to um, the greater numbers. And I bring up these variants of concern because it leads to a common question uh, that comes up when we talk about vaccines. Will the vaccines that are rolling out right now be effective against these different strains? The vaccine manufacturers say, yeah, probably, and they would say that, but the World Health Organization also says, yeah, probably. Um, and even if they're wrong about that, then the good news is it's easier to modify an existing vaccine than to develop an entirely new one. This is what we do with the flu vaccine every year. We know how safe and effective the general formula is, and then we can tweak the um, manufacturing process to... Um, change the strain that the vaccine protects against each year. The manufacturing capability and the supply chain and the people and programs to administer the vaccine are already in place. Now this Sankey diagram uh, shows on the left, let me get my pointer out, shows on the left uh, some of the most successful vaccine candidates and on the right the countries that have committed to buying large amounts of vaccines and the number that they've committed to. And the thickness of the line here from left to right represents the, uh, the relative, well, the absolute number of vaccines that have been purchased by each country. Um, I'll share a link to an article um, that explains the, some of the differences between some of the top vaccine candidates as well. Uh, now we have Australia down here, which has committed to buying 115 million doses of the vaccine. Um, we need multiple vaccines per person because we'll probably need boosters. Well, definitely some of the vaccines we show that we need to have two uh, vaccines for it to be effective. Um, but this is, um, as you can see, obviously more than four times the population of Australia. So we are doing pretty well here, um, assuming these, um, these doses of the various vaccines arrive. 
Now, these are the three vaccines that the Australian government has committed to supplying to the Australian people, um, and they have different strengths and weaknesses. They have different... Um, they make use of different technologies, which is um, a clever move, I think, um, since they might have different effectiveness, um, and indeed they uh, have shown different effectiveness in clinical trials. Uh, the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine... A, an advantage of that one is that it's going to be manufactured in Australia under licence by CSL. One of the downsides of it might be that uh, in some cases it may prevent infection and spread in vaccinated people. Um, sorry, it may only protect against symptoms and not protect against infection and spread. Uh, just prevents against um, having um, um, symptoms of the disease. Uh, the Novavax formulation um, seems quite effective in preventing disease uh, and definitely does prevent transmission and provokes a strong antibody response. Uh, and the Pfizer-BioNTech formulation has a very high effectiveness. Um, it's a new formulation, an mRNA vaccine, but the downside of that is that it needs to be stored on dry ice or in uh, deep freezes of um, minus 80 degrees Celsius, which... Um, uh, they do exist in hospitals and labs, but obviously there's issues getting to regional and rural uh, and remote parts of the country. Um, yeah, so there are advantages and disadvantages with each of these vaccines. So I think it's quite a good strategy to have um, these different vaccines as part of Australia's strategy. Um, so these have all been through safety trials, and while I would choose the one um, with the highest effectiveness if I had the choice, I won't have that choice and I will be happy with uh, any of these three vaccines when I'm able to get one. Uh, I think it's great that we've gone from worrying that a vaccine might not be available until the end of this year to worrying about which one of the three we will get at the start of the year. The Australian government made a poor decision a few weeks ago when it said it would delay the availability of vaccines to make sure they're safe. Uh, the government has since gone back on that position. These have been through the appropriate safety trials. Um, Australia has a high rate of vaccination and we want these vaccines. As for who gets it first, there's modelling around the amount of illness and death that would be um, prevented, whether uh, depending on whether people over a certain age or frontline healthcare workers or quarantine staff get it first. And I'm not prepared to criticise any of these approaches, but I will share a link to a video that discusses these different approaches and also explains how many Australians need to get the vaccine and how effective it needs to be in order to achieve herd immunity. That's the point at which COVID-19 can no longer spread in the Australian community and that is what it means for the virus to be eliminated from Australia. So now moving on uh, from the vaccine, Will eliminating COVID-19 in Australia fix everything? <laughs> the answer is no. It will only take us back to where we were a year ago, and that is an economy on the brink of recession and a continent on fire. Uh, this slide shows why we need to take economic forecasts with a grain of salt. These are forecasts by the Reserve Bank of Australia um, showing... Uh, forecasted wages growth every year from 2011 through to 2017. Each year they predicted strong growth in wages that uh, never happened and instead of adjusting their predictions they just stuck with unbridled optimism every year. These models are based on wishful thinking rather than observed past events and at some point it becomes an obvious lie. Now with that said Australia's economy in 2020 has taken less of a hit than most countries, and that has a lot to do with how um, relatively little COVID-19 we have in this country. We've suppressed a lot of economic activity for the sake of infection control, and as it turns out, keeping people alive and healthy is very good for the economy. Um, starting from this position, which is enviable by world standards, what does our recovery look like? These are the Science Party's 12 core principles, and we think they're good all the time, before, during, and after a pandemic. So let's take a look at some of them in detail. 
Starting with research and education, um, at the start of last year, Australian universities relied on international students for a quarter of their income. That market has collapsed and we don't know how many international students are going to come back and when. The loss of income has led to an estimated 21,000 people losing their jobs at universities. The Science Party has long said that Australia should double its research spending. We saw a one-off injection of $2 billion into coronavirus research this year, and that's great, but we're talking about committing an extra $10 billion to research every year. This is an investment that pays itself off economically, not to mention that we get the benefit of new discoveries. And these new discoveries should not be exclusively in medical research. Part of our extra research should be into clean energy. We can support employment while prepare, repairing some environmental harms by investing in clean energy instead of subsidising fossil fuels. The, our economic recovery, um, as much as the COVID Coordination Commission would have us believe, it's not going to be gas-led. Natural gas is a transition fuel, and we are using it now. We're in that transition. That means we need to move away from it. As well as research, we should build infrastructure like pumped hydro and grid interconnections. The Science Party supports these measures to support a target of 800% renewables. That is, producing eight times more electricity than we use through uh, clean energy means. We can export this excess clean energy just like we currently export about eight times more coal than we use. Or we can use this excess clean energy to produce high value goods like steel rather than um, exporting the raw iron ore. The states and territory governments know that um, investing in renewables is profitable. If they were doing it to protect the environment, they would be more enthusiastic about conservation, preserving biodiversity and ecosystems. A healthy environment is crucial to human health and we can reduce our impact without reducing our standard of living. However, that will take bold policy and fearless leadership because recklessly taking what we want from the environment has been the way we've done things for centuries and we need to make a drastic change. Also crucial to human health is, of course, strong public health systems. Everyone should have access to... Um, to the best standard of medical care, regardless of their bank balance. The Science Party backs an Australian Centre for Disease Control as well, an ACDC, to coordinate our approach to prevention, management and surveillance of diseases. The best time to have had one of those was last year. The second best time to have one is now. Now this next point under healthcare is uh, not science party policy, but personally I would love to end public funding of private health insurance. The federal government pays $6 billion every year to directly subsidise people to take out public health uh, private health insurance. This money could be better spent improving the public health system, uh, including adding basic dental care to Medicare. That last bit about dental is science party policy. There are savings to be made in public spending beyond redirecting fossil fuel subsidies and private health rebates to uh, the public systems and clean energy. Um, public spending uh, features a constant stream of badly spent money. There's sports rorts. There's been the Great Barrier Reef Foundation getting half a billion dollars to do. It didn't even know what it was going to do with that money. The Murray-Darling Basin debacle. Money that should be spent bettering the nation is instead spent on obvious dud projects, whether through incompetence or malice. An a, a federal anti-corruption commission would have a chance of stopping these rorts and establishing a federal anti-corruption commission, a federal ICAC, is science party policy. What about the day-to-day -day cost of living? It's great that the GST was finally removed from tampons recently. I appreciate that each tampon now costs two cents less. That saving was in fact passed on to the consumer, believe it or not. But um, gee, it'd be even better if my rent was half as much as it is now. House prices have been increasing well ahead of wages for 20 years now. 20 years ago, Australia introduced the capital gains tax discount, which makes 
investing in housing particularly attractive because if you make money buying and selling houses, you pay less tax on that profit than if you'd been paid that money as wages. Science party policy is to end the capital gains tax discount. Uh, so go ahead, buy and sell houses, but you shouldn't expect a tax break for doing so compared to uh, people who get their money through working. This perversity in Australia's housing market puts Australians under increasing financial stress as um, housing becomes a bigger and bigger part of the household budget. We have to look after our citizens' basic needs if they can't afford to do so through income from work. We can afford to. We are a rich country that can afford to support Australians like this. Many people couldn't work last year, including um, international um, students who, who we had invited here to study. They should also be able to access that kind of help in a crisis. Job seeker payments seemed acceptable to most people who needed them because the payment rate was temporarily doubled. The original rate is just $280 per week, equivalent to just 14 hours of the minimum wage. It hasn't increased in real terms for 25 years and we just we can't go back to that. We can't go back to expecting people to pay rent and look for work on that kind of a pittance. We need to raise the rate by at least $75 per week, which is equivalent to the current coronavirus supplement. And to make sure that year on year the rate goes up and keeps up with the cost of living. So for all of the current government's focus on budget surpluses, it turns out they could, in fact, spend more when people desperately needed it. As it becomes safer to go back to the activities that had to be put on hold during the pandemic, we need to invest in the things that make a country and make people confident and prosperous. The research pipeline, a safe climate, new clean energy jobs, our health and the integrity of the public service. 2020 was defined by the short-term response to the pandemic, and we made it very clear that science funding leads directly to scientific discovery. 2021 will be defined by the ways in which we move forward as a society, and we can do better than the old normal.